Hi and welcome to the Homeopathy Health Show. I am Atik Amadbati, a fourth generation homeopath with over 20 years of professional experience in this field of healing. In the Homeopathy Health Show, I'll be talking all things homeopathy and natural with guest interviews, tips and advice and answering some of your questions. Homeopathy is truly a unique complementary system of healing suitable for all ages, young and old. I'd love to hear from you and welcome your questions on homeopathy and how it can or has helped you. Feel free to email me at health at liketreatslike.co.uk or visit www.liketreatslike.co.uk for more information. Once you're there, take a look at the Knowledge Academy and blog section where you will find interesting information. Both sections are growing day by day, so always check back. So let's begin today's show on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio, real feel-good radio. Hi everyone, I hope you're well, and of course, I hope and pray it remains that way. So it's been quite an insightful few weeks, hasn't it, on the Homeopathy Health Show, speaking with Pete Hill on dementia, Camilla Scher on her work with the NGO Homeopathy for Health in Africa, which she founded alongside her husband, Jeremy Scher, from the Dynamis School. And in fact, that interview also focused on agri-homeopathy, which is a very interesting and upcoming field, which is to do with homeopathy for plants. And then I was able to speak to Herman Kepler on his journey to homeopathy and the importance and the role of nutrition in well-being and overall wellness. Homeopathy itself, you know, is a lifelong commitment to learning from postgraduate studies itself, research, a deeper study on the nature of remedies, and there is so much more as well. Training to become a homeopath is actually where it all starts, and it can start at any age. Some start young, others at a later stage in life. And that, interestingly enough, is one of the beauties in this incredible healing sciences. The possibilities are endless. So what does homeopathy entail? Where does one study? What's involved? How much time needs to be given and how many years are to be committed? So to answer this, I've invited three recent homeopathic graduates from across the UK to today's show to share their experiences and provide you with a tangible example of their learning experiences and graduating as homeopaths. So it's going to be excellent. I'm so looking forward to this. So I welcome Elsa Friel on the show. She's joining me from Belfast. Elsa studied at the Belfast School of Homeopathy and graduated in 2016. Hi, Elsa. Welcome to the Homeopathy Health Show. Hello, Atik. Thank you for having me on. It's lovely to speak with you today. Next, we have Rosie Anderson. And Rosie studied at the College of Practical Homeopathy and graduated post-COVID last year. Hi, Rosie. Great to have you on the show. Hi, Ati. It's lovely to be here. It's an interesting story with um, uh, Rosie, actually, which I must share. Um, I came across Rosie on her Instagram, and uh, it was quite a a, a fun post, which uh, got my attention purely because she had a Materia Medica or a repertory in her hand, and it just so happened to be the same one that I've got on my shelf. And we made contact, and here you are. (laughs) <laughs> Robin Murphy for life <laughs> <laughs> and last but certainly not least is Melissa Bradshaw Weaver and Melissa graduated from the Salisbury College uh, the Salisbury Homeopathy College in 2020 hi Melissa thank you so much for coming on today's Homeopathy L show hi Atik I'm really excited to be here so the first question that I would ask you, and in fact, I've asked all my guests um, over the past several episodes, is your interest in homeopathy. What made you go down this route, Ailsa? Yeah, it's a hard one to answer because homeopathy for me was always, it was always there as a young teenager, I suppose. We were um, encouraged to use it by a local GP at the time, actually, which was quite refreshing. And um, so, yeah, there was always a blue box in the in the house. And um, my aunt then studied at the Irish school in Dublin. So she was very encouraging of it as well and our use of it. We always went to it. 
And then really, I think fundamentally then it was my sister who, who used homeopathy. Um, she was having a challenging time for a moment in her life. And um, we seen its, its power. It was just incredible. And that essentially brought me to study homeopathy. We, we got our sister back, basically. And uh, it was just incredible. I thought, I need, I need to know more about this. This is incredible. So, yeah, I signed up a couple of weeks um, later. I was in the Belfast School of Homeopathy, how it happened. In a large majority of homeopaths themselves, they have used homeopathy through a friend or through a family member and as a result of that, they have become com- convinced. And certainly at the time of uh, Dr. Samuel Hahnemann and just after, a number of eminent homeopaths, this is this is their journey. This is how they became interested in homeopathy, where a friend of a friend referred them. Uh, they used homeopathy. They were cured of their ailment. And, uh, you know, they the, the question arose, what is this science? You know, let us learn more. So and the rest is history, I suppose, <laughs> as they mm-hmm. say. So you're a second generation, I suppose, aren't you? I guess. I never thought of it like that before, <laughs> but um, I guess I am. And I think as well, if my father had the opportunity, he definitely would have probably studied something like this too, because he's very, very encouraging of it and interested in it. So, yeah, yeah, I would say that's true. Well, welcome from a fourth generation to a second generation. It's amazing. <laughs> so lovely. It's incredible. So, Rosie, how about your journeys? Um, Yeah, I feel like I had a similar experience in that it was dotted throughout my life. My mum used to see a homeopath quite regularly. Um, I think, you know, a couple of times as children, it got rid of our warts and stuff. But, like, there was no major thing, but it was fairly normal to use in my life. Um, And then I was diagnosed with epilepsy as a child. And I had um, really quite uncontrollable teen- um, seizures throughout my teenage years. Um, I was on a lot of high dose anticonvulsants, and I, I mm. really felt lost as to where my symptoms ended and the side effects began and kind of just very disconnected from my body. And I went through a really difficult time afterwards. I kind of I got my health back on track physically and then my mental, emotional health really deteriorated after that kind of trying to figure out what had happened for the last four or five years and my, where my health was at and managing living kind of somewhat dulled down under the effects of um, medications. Um, and I was going through a difficult period and I kind of, I got shivers then when you said, Elsa, about like you got your sister back um, because that's what I felt homeopathy did for me. I felt like I came back. I went through a really tough time and I just... It's all a bit of a blurb. I remember my mum calling a homeopath in a panic. I remember just explaining to my mum how awful I felt. And she just got this number and just rang it and just said it. And she answered miraculously. You know, she has a really bit busy clinic, but she answered the phone and she said, I can see her in the next couple of days. Um, and I just have never looked back since. She completely transformed my health. Um, I've since seen several homeopaths um but I just came back mind body spirit I'm now on no prescription medications my health's never been better and it was my homeopath who really said to me you should look into exploring this is something that you can do I feel like you have a skill for it I feel like you have the kind of intuition for it and she really encouraged me and yeah it just slowly went from being patient to student to graduate what a journey quite inspiring and like I said you know so many go through these types of journey and everybody has different experiences um I recently <clears throat> treated someone very close to me who had um, a heart attack and after two days they had a stroke and uh, today that individual is walking talking as if there are no signs of having a stroke and homeopathy was the 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 principal factor here for getting him back on his feet, being able to talk with no sign at all from um, the muscles of the face, for example, droop when you sometimes have a stroke, you know, and so forth. This, you can't tell. And these are the miracles of just a few select remedies. It wasn't even a huge concoction. They were just selected remedies 
which were given at appropriate times. Uh, so that's the power of homeopathy, you know. Melissa, Hi. <laughs> <are you> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's uh, it's fascinating, isn't it? So do share uh, your journey to homeopathy. So mine's probably a very different story to Elsa's and Rosie's in that I um, was brought up purely conventionally um, antibiotics for this, antibiotics for that. So I, I and I knew of homeopathy. But that was it. Um, and then when my eldest daughter is now, she's now nearly 16. When she was about three, I had an inexplicable draw towards studying homeopathy. Um, I was working in a completely different career at the time. I was in aerospace. There was a buyer for raw materials. So it wasn't even anything linked. Um, but I was looking, there was something in me. I was looking for something along the lines of like natural health um, because I just felt this pull um, and I wasn't that well at the time. And I, I found this course with um, the Chichester School of Homeopathy. Anyway, I looked into it and my little girl, well, she was three at the time. And I thought, no, that sounds great, but it's not, this is not the right time. Anyway, it got parked. And um, I, as I said, I wasn't very well. I hadn't been very well from having my little girl. Um, and that illness got progressively worse to a point where she was coming up for six and I went to find a homeopath to help me and I did that and she supported me through my own return to health which was incredible um and as that was going on I was thinking do you know what I can really feel this pull I don't I don't know what's going on here I really want to know more I've had this pull to know about it the pull is now stronger so within a year of starting my own homeopathic treatment I, I signed up and started at Salisbury Homeopathy College and um <laughs> I honestly didn't really know what I was there for. I, I, I just I just had this pull and I did I did some background reading on it um, and it was enough to get me really sort of worked up and inspired and like, oh, my God, I can't. You know, I'm really so excited about starting this. And and that was it. And with that start, my, my little girl also then began receiving homeopathic treatment and um, it, it kind of changed my life completely. So there, there is, you know, there's no one in my family who did use it at that time who had, they had no understanding of it. But now here I am, I'm, my mum and dad have their own Miranda Castro book, and they are excellent at treating their own acutes. It's quite phenomenal. And my husband is a big fan of it. And I've since had another little girl who's seven, and she she just knows what remedy she needs. She will go to the drawer and she'll say, mum, I've done this, I need a hypericum. And I just... Uh, I it's it's become my life my way of life my family's way of life so I I sort of quite thankful for getting as ill as I did but also having that 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 sort of weird pull to something I knew nothing about and um that was it my my life changed in a heartbeat so obviously now I'm now no longer an aerospace buyer <laughs> my life flipped on its on its completely on its back so that's uh, another amazing story you know, it's interesting you mentioned this poll because, frankly speaking, homeopathy is not for everybody. But the ones that do become homeopaths, I don't think I've ever come across a homeopath who isn't successful. And it's because of that, you know, what we're doing, all of us, are, is a service to humanity. We're helping people. We're helping improve their lives. And it's not just through homeopathic remedies because a large chunk, of course, uh, involves listening to the patient and discussing things with them. There's a lot of counselling involved with, within homeopathy itself. Yeah, I think I was definitely, um, so I fell into nursing as straight from school. Like I say, I was quite unwell and I needed something that I could study locally and there was a nursing school kind of 15 minutes away from me. So I felt, I knew I wanted to help people, but I didn't know like the kind of, mode that I would be doing that in and nursing seemed an option that I had that I could use that desire that I had but it felt it it didn't feel right it didn't feel I didn't feel a desire to be studying it and I think I internalized a lot of that as like I'm not a hard worker I'm not someone who works very hard at things but actually since discovering homeopathy I really think of myself as a, a really hard worker now. I've done the vast majority of my studying since having a baby and postpartum kind of like nursing a baby with a book in the other hand. And I really 
my desire is there to study and learn more. It's just, I just wasn't looking at the right thing. And I think if you find it and it feels right for you, the desire is there and then the passion just comes immediately. What about you, Elsa? You know, oh, it's so lovely hearing these stories as well. And it's just, I think too, with homeopathy, it's an energy giving medicine and it does give us a lot of energy being around it, using it. it it's so amazing. But us women too, um, I don't want to make it about men and women because there's some fan- fantastic men that, that do so much as well. But women do find so much space, like, <laughs> like yourself. <Yes. laughs> Sorry, for, I, I was actually pointing to myself there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just I have so much um, admiration for women who who do it all. It's it you know it is it it's still really hard being a woman a woman um, in this day and age and being mum, you know, being care, you know, working full time as as we're all trying to do as well, um, and and help people and, and create that caring environment as well. It, it's a it's a very tough career to do it in as well you know so everybody's held and feels supported yeah um so it's it's incredible yeah these are amazing um, the beauty of homeopathy itself is actually the simplicity i know that we have advanced technologically and medically as well and, and in all fields around the world and that's just a good thing and testament that you know, mankind is progress is progressing, humankind is progressing in all fields. But sometimes it's not just about progression. 200 years ago, a German doctor, over 200 years ago, a German doctor who was very God-fearing, extremely humble, very loving, had this passion and commitment and to find something that would help serve humanity because all he saw around him at that time was pain, pain from the ailments, pain from the way those diseases and ailments were treated. And he carried on, and he carried on for a very, very long period of time. And ultimately, he was victorious. And it's testament to the homeopaths that are practicing today, who are taking interest in homeopathy, who are qualifying as homeopathic practitioners and you know, uh, around the world, of course, other courses where you can actually qualify as a homeopathic doctor. So, you know, you you would be a doctor of homeopathy. So it's just amazing. And and what I find is with what the stories that you're giving me is that the simplicity of homeopathy doesn't take anything away from the science itself. As a working mother, being a homeopath doesn't mean you have to remember all the medical terminology because the beauty of it is it's based on the holistic approach, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's listening to the patient, looking at the patient, picking up certain notes. Uh, Colin Griffith, I was talking to a few weeks ago on the show, and um, he was a classical music composer before he became a homeopath. And his mindset is fascinating because he he opened up and he said, even now I treat patients in a, a as if, I'm composing um, something. And, and that, I found that really interesting. He said, you know, they've got peaks and troughs and, and different notes, and I pick them up. And that's the beauty, because it may be a science, but it's also an art. I'm an artist. I paint my own pictures. Ailsa, Rosie, Melissa, you're different artists, and you have your own way of expression. It's so open. It's so flexible. It's so adaptable. It's so, uh, you know, you can mold it. You can ply it. Yeah. yeah, we were always told at college not to worry, you know, as long as we 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 were following the science, as it were, to come to the, the right prescription. Another homeopath might follow another path to come to what they deem to be the right prescription. Ultimately, we both had the same aim, that healing for that patient, but we might do it two different ways, which is kind of representative of our, our backgrounds and, and how we all became homeopaths. We all like a bit like Colin Griffiths. We all see our own sort of notes, as it were in the cases don't we and and the essences of the patients and um I know as a, as a newbie to a relative newbie to it sometimes I'm still sort of like 
oh, well, another homeopath might not come to this conclusion. They might not see this remedy, but I can see it and it gets you in a little bit of a wibble. <laughs> but yeah, that's the beauty of it, isn't it? The individualistic side of it for both the practitioner and the patient, I see. There's there's actually a fun side to this as well, isn't it? Um, I don't know if it's fun, but uh, certainly I find myself always looking at when I speak to anybody I'm just looking at their constitution even outside when you're shopping and you're observing people in the supermarket and then I have to say stop it don't do that you know? yeah. you're here to you're here to get milk and eggs you know um, don't don't so don't analyze people but uh, it's interesting though isn't it because it's a, it's a tool that actually helps certainly helps us to develop more to know people because if you know a certain person let's just focus on constitution as an example. But if you know their traits and it's quite obvious that someone is a calc carb or someone's a nux vomica or whatever, um, it actually helps us to be able to engage with them because we know their strengths and weaknesses. And, and of course, that's the same for us, isn't it? It's a form of empathy. It's recognizing that in every kind of constitutional picture, if we follow that of like, with every for Nuxomica with the for the anger side there's also the really driven side and for the the, the this is that and each you can kind of recognize the yin, yin and yang of each person yeah. and kind of go okay they can see that they've got this aspects of that but that means that they must have that aspect so and how do how can we get them to find the equal balance of both but it's not that there is a negative I've I've um read like a really beautiful post the other day um about talking about how wonderful talking about putting like a positive spin on some remedies that sometimes get like a bit of a negative idea and one of them was pulsatilla um and she was kind of talking about it from a feminist perspective kind of saying like they get such a bad rap because they're it's the feminine it's the girly kind of weepy sad cry I want my boyfriend do you love me like it's kind of from a bit of a negative towards women kind of way but that's it's the divine feminine that's coming through it's that that's what makes them such you know wonderful caring loving really deeply feeling people and it was just looking at the opposite side of the coin of yes they can have this tendencies but they can also really have these tendencies so I think it is kind of like an empathy that it develops by being able to see people with that whole whole picture you know, I find I give pulsatilla more to men, by the way, just so you know. You. <laughs> and and CP as well, and Ignatia as well. So <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I wanted to talk to you really about your life as a student. So do share what was it what was it like? How long were your courses uh, as far as your respective courses that you've undertaken? And what was involved? You know, what's life like juggling everything as well? And uh you know, the, the modules that you had to focus upon, perhaps some of the books that you you were you know you had to read as part of the the, the course itself. Uh, Elsa, so let's go to you. Yeah, sure. You know, so it's it's been since two thousand and sixteen since I graduated. It feels like yesterday, but it was seven years ago now. So I had to really just uh, refamiliarize myself with with the course, even though I'm now teaching at the school um yes yeah, so I went to the Belfast School of Homeopathy and um it was incredible it's a really in incredible school I get really excited and proud when I talk about it because it's actually cooperative it's run by the, the students and the staff and because of that they're able to um the cost isn't as as much as regular homeopathy courses so that was wonderful. So it allowed a lot more people um, able to go. With the Belfast School as well, in a year, there's 12 weekends in the year. So we would have met, it would have been part-time meeting at the weekend. So like once, sometimes twice a month. And that would be the whole weekend. So from Saturday through to Sunday, um, nine to five, basically. It was intense. It was incredible. You know, you're just so excited leaving on Sunday and and driving and so excited to go in on a Saturday morning. The structure was um, so for first and second year, your learning is is all about homeopathy, what it is, the fundamentals, the foundations of it. 
mm. a lot of looking at organin. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so we would have had to really know that, know that well or read it, you know, and keep it beside our bed and uh, make sure we were looking at it. It's um, an interesting so, read, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Not, not know, always so, easy. It's so not. I really must go back to it. It's something I, I do look at, but I must go back to it again. It was it was great. Um, second year would have been more delving deeper into those themes. Again, you're getting deeper and deeper, learning more and more. You know, with a lot more focus on the physical body, the anatomy, just to get a general understanding of it, diseases, disease in the body, and looking at organ supports then, I suppose, through that. So yeah, there was a, there was a lot to take in. At the end of every year, we had to submit a project, be working on it throughout the year. So a first aid project, family remedies would have been another one. A lot of work. I mean, we're asked to put in about 15 hours during the week. You were saying earlier, if you're enthusiastic about something, you just don't see the time going in. So it was a pleasure, not a chore to do that work and to, yeah, to do the homeworks. Like third year then, you're stepping up a level um, the clinic started. So we would have had um, on a Sunday, we would have held a clinic. Um, so we would have invited um, patients in through word of mouth or some of the um, students in our class might have known them. And it, it was acute, acute prescribing. But as you know, a lot of the time, those acutes always turn into chronics. Um, so that was incredible. So the clinics went into fourth year as well during their third year we had to um start taking our own cases for our own portfolio at the end of the graduation we were required to take five cases and have three supervised follow-ups for each case so yeah we needed a, a homeopath then to to guide us and supervise us and again, in four, fourth year, you're getting, you know, you're getting into the, the nitty gritty of, um, you know, of case taking, the reality of it, um, the tough cases, you know, that you would meet, you know, abuse and cancer and, and mm. you know, triggers, realizing what your triggers were also and, and having and being very supported through through that process. So, yeah, that was the structure. Quite a um, good focus as well on uh, practical development as well, which is which is quite interesting. So the you know the courses across the UK I know that are offered by a number of colleges do include a large chunk of practical experience, and and of course that's key, isn't it, uh, Rosie? Yeah, I um, studied at the College of Practical Homeopathy, and I chose my course largely based on how encouraging it was of ta- actively taking cases. My course was a postgraduate course, which you're only eligible for if you are a medical professional. So doctors, nurses, vets, and it was kind of like a fast track transition from allopathic medicine to homeopathy. So you kind of were able to skip some of the what would be on other courses about kind of anatomy and physiology and things like that, because they presumed that you had that knowledge already and you just went straight into here's homeopathy here's how to apply it get started as soon as you can so I I think by like month module three or four so month three or four for me I was taking cases um, under supervision but it was really encouraging to it doesn't matter if you feel you know if you're not sure if you're doing it right it's under supervision you're not going to be doing any harm but get used to take case taking kind of repertorizing and remedy differentiation and just getting your head around that how different that is from the allopathic model and trying to transition to that as soon as you can and I I loved I was scared to take my first case I was really scared but actually it was it was how I learned completely and so to graduate the biggest part of your graduation was three in-depth cases that you'd seen four times and all of the analysis from that and reviews and stuff and I really really loved the more practical side I think that's when you do your majority of your learning or, or that was it for me that's uh, very, very interesting actually the um you mentioned about case taking i even growing up with homeopathy and and seeing bottles of homeopathic medicines everywhere uh when i i remember when i still opened you know professionally i opened my clinic and i had my first even though family friends colleagues but when you have someone 
from outside who is not related to you at all as your first patient there's there's always that nervousness you know uh, I, I remember that I don't remember it fondly but I was thinking oh no you know um I hope I I hope I can help them because otherwise it's going to go south very badly <laughs> <laughs> it's like developing uh, that self-assurance like first assurance in the remedies and that no, having that belief that like I know that these can help and then these then the next level is like assurance in yourself that I know I can find the one that you need to help and just trying to get them over that finish line of like you having yes. the trust in yourself so that they can have the trust in you it's daunting absolutely what's uh what's Melissa what are your experiences as far as your uh, uh course and learning at the Salisbury College um so mine was a four-year part-time course and a bit like Elsa's, we would um, have uh, weekend classes. So we would go to Salisbury nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, finish five o'clock on a Sunday evening. Really intense, but amazing. And uh, again, like Elsa, we'd have um, we'd be encouraged to do about around 10 to 15 hours per week. The first couple of years home study during that time, I think first and second year, there was definitely a shift between what we were learning first and second year compared to third and fourth first and second year was very much a case of um, getting our heads around the, the, you know, the remedy pictures, learning to repertorize. There was a lot of rep work, which gave us a really good grounding because they are, they are something else, aren't they, to find your way through. Um, a lot of history, philosophy, um, yeah, a, a lot of history surrounding how homeopathy came about and, you know, health and medicine in general at those times. So it, it was fantastic for me to be able to put it into context and how it all sort of developed. And again, you know, remedy work, A and P, different phases. We looked at children's health, men's health, ladies' health, acute versus chronic, uh, mental health. It, 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 that was always on the go in in the background. But I think then in, in getting to year three, we were then that's when we started our own SCP. So we had to see um, a minimum of ten patients, a minimum of three times each. Obviously, all supervised. Um, when we got towards the end, the supervisor sometimes wasn't there, but we still would have to submit. And every case was submitted for, you know, approval before we were able to prescribe. Uh, I mean, the run up to that, going from very early in year one, we were encouraged to go to um, clinics for observation. So they weren't run during the college weekends. These were run separately by two of the the directors or the, the lecturers who worked at the college so that would be an extra sort of chunk of time. And I was able to manage it. I worked part time. I strictly had a two and a half day working week at that point. So I mm. could kind of manage it. It was like another slot in there. And we had to build up a minimum of a hundred, I can't remember now, a hundred hours over the four years of, of just purely going along to observe. And obviously, as we went through from year one to year four, it would go from observation through to obviously be, having a more active participation in the clinic, encouraged to ask the um, patients questions and, and, you know, and then working on the case afterwards. So that was that was really hands on by the end of it. I think the first few I was terrified and I sat there with the the year fours and they were asking all these deep questions. I was like, oh, I have no I have no idea what to ask. I'll just be a wallflower, sit at the back here and watch. And um, likewise, like Rosie said, by the time we got to do our first supervised clinical case which was halfway through year three it was about four years ago as now and I do you know what I worked myself (laughs) into a bit of a frenzy over that and I was quite terrified but actually I think beyond the first couple I I lost that nervousness and then really started to get my own thing going and you know I was using I was using a bit of a script and crib sheets to find my way through the first few consultations and it was probably quite rigid and me checking all the time. But, you know, within a couple of months, I'd kind of really relaxed on that and, and and found my own flow, as it were. So that took up the majority of the end of year three. And of course, most of year four. So. You, know, you know, as you mentioned that, um, I was thinking the first time I opened a repertory, and I thought, what is this? You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, what's going on here? It was so funny because I, I was laughing at myself. I thought, there is no way. That I'm going to understand what this means, because because of the sub chapters and then the, the, you know the, yeah. well uh, for anyone who's used a repertory, it's difficult to explain it like this. But uh, you know, there's uh, it, it's uh, it's a maze, but uh, over time you get yeah. quite familiar with the way uh, with the maze, and you do find the way out. 
<laughs> and you find the way in first and then you know which path you're going to yeah um, we did we did a lot of work thankfully on that in yeah. year one and um because it is and it's the language of the repertories as well uh, you know we used um synthesis um and I, I, since actually since i've graduated i use murphy's more uh, um but yeah the, the language is is really something to get your head around isn't it it's, often it's quite <laughs> often it's quite dated and um yes like you're know, riding in a streetcar aggravates all that kind of stuff <laughs> like, yeah. it's stuff you learn and then it sticks but you know year one and two looking at that I was like well you know mind blown a little bit so um it, was, it was a massive learning <laughs> that's actually the beauty that with homeopathy so just very briefly as an example because we've spoken about repertory so you know no other system can go this deep eyes we're looking at a chapter called eyes within that there's a ch- with a sub chapter um called vision and here it says vision is fiery and then w- below that uh vision is fiery with circles vision is fiery with rays vision uh, is fiery and you have spots or zigzags then you have another area which says vision is foggy afternoon between 3 to 4 p.m. after 4 in the air bright when it's candlelight no other system can can match this that the the depth that the provings have gone through and obviously uh, you know with with practice and skill a homeopath can very easily repertorize and get to a remedy let's just say it was just eyes and everything else was fine but when you go to the mind chapter for example in a repertory it's huge you know there's so much available for uh, being restless with a fever during being restless when you have gout that's what makes homeopathy so successful because it's so drills down so deep that you get to a remedy out of thousands of homeopathic remedies or medicines you know and um that's why it's curative yeah and i think patients find that quite surprising don't they i know you know when i have patients who are completely new to homeopathy um the the, the questions that i ask them they, they, you can always see in their face like why on earth are you asking me this it's mm. they because they've never been asked it before and it's new to them to understand that it's so precise it's very interesting that point because, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, and please do share. But whenever somebody comes with an ailment, I always ask well, one of the questions I always ask is, What happened at that time in your life? And they say, well, wh- wh- How's that related to this illness? You know, I, I'm saying I've got, I don't know, fibromyalgia, and you're asking me if I was stressed before I got it or did something happen. But that's the key. Mm-hmm. That That's actually the key, isn't it? It's interesting, you know, you know, you're saying that those moments when you ask those questions, you know, where you, you, you're looking at the cause and, you know, the start of this, it's almost like when they're answering as well, they're realizing for the first time, this is how that, you know, this is how this started. I know this now. How have I never, how have I never realized this before? And it's always lovely. There's, there's almost like a release. Of self-discovery with them as well and healing with that which is which is amazing a homeopath who um is a good friend of mine i was asking her for advice on case taking and she said all of she's been a homeopath for maybe 40 50 years now and she said rosie every home every patient who i've ever seen has always told me what remedy that they need they've always told me exactly what they need i just keep asking can you tell me more about that can you tell me more about that and as it unravels, they will figure it out themselves and they will tell, communicate it to me and I will then give them the, the remedy that they need. And I saw her at one point and she did that for me and she kept, she, she kind of kept saying, and, and what was going on at that time? And can you tell me more about that? And can you tell me more about that? And then I kind of just went, and then this had happened. And it just, and I felt that relief of like, oh, I, that, I know what it was. And then I told her and then we resolved it. But it, it is that feeling of just being completely understood that I mm. was never was never able to give a patient with allopathy when I you know in my nursing practice I was never able to make them feel that understood because we never had the time or the skill set to be able to give them that really intense kind of therapy and talking that they needed to understand it themselves to then let, allow us to understand it as well so it's a real blessing to be able to have that much time to be able to go with that deep like you say Atik and just keep exploring and keep discovering and keep pulling layers back that that is just it's such a special experience to be able to share with someone 
And the healing, Melissa, also is very much to do with listening, isn't it? Because all these examples are, you listen, and sometimes that release of pressure, somebody is talking to you about some of their losses or something they've gone through, which has really affected them all their life. And you can feel that relief when it's actually uh, off their chest. And it just needs somebody to listen. And homeopaths are in a prime position because without listening, we can't prescribe. Yeah. It's not 10 minutes. It's half an hour. It's an hour. It's as long as it takes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I do, again, patients who are new to homeopathy, I do tell them how long this is going to be, but I don't think a lot really sort of get the gist of how, how much they're going to be able to talk about stuff in that time, because there's a lot of people are not used to be able to do in that. And I've, I always say to patients as well, sometimes the first remedy, sometimes the first prescription is you just being able to talk. Um, and I have had a few patients who have just been quite tearful within tears of like joy and relief afterwards not not mm-hmm. not sadness so much sort of like because they've been able to talk and just as as Elsa says like made that connection between when symptoms have started and what was going on for them and it's been the first time they're able to make that connection but also that 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 sort of oh ability to to download in a, in a safe place and and in start to make those connections in their head as to how things have happened You know, we're in such a blessed position to be able to help people. Honestly, I I, I just always amazes me that it's it's such, honestly, it's a true blessing because to be able to help somebody, and as you've said, just by listening, sometimes half the problem goes away. And that's, isn't that a really humbling experience? Isn't that an honor to be able to be in that position where you can truly make a difference and heal somebody and Get, let them get on with their life, you know, and let them go on their own path. But let them go on a path where I, I use the example of the back uh, back flower remedy, walnut, you know, they're stuck, but you just push them along and they've gone. And they say, right, I couldn't move before, but now I know which way I need to go. How humbling is that, don't you think? Humbling is the word, I think, overall. And it's really important just, yeah, to, to honour that space too and yeah, continue to do so. It's been. Uh... I know you can hear a little budgie in the background. He's chatting away. It might sound like I'm in some like beautiful woodland somewhere. It's my budgie <laughs> in front of me in his cage. You can imagine if there's a parrot and you taught it the homeopathic remedies, right? <laughs> well, he does. Arnica, belladonna, buzzardilla. <laughs> yeah, the only thing he can say is Alexa. Unfortunately. Oh no! no, no, no. <laughs> I'll uh, just move him away. <laughs> me and Alexa have issues. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to end uh, our conversation, actually, with um, some questions for you, which uh, I'm sure the listeners will be delighted to to, to know the answer to. So let's start with uh, Melissa. Four questions. Your favourite book, uh, as in homeopathic book? I'm a, bit, I'm a bit of a book addict. So I, the, the problem with homeopathic books is they become a bit of a guilty pleasure. So, but I recently, I did recently invest in a new map med um, and I'd been working through a number of the years, but my new map med and my new favorite map med is Nature's Materia Medica. And I'm not sure how I hadn't found that before. Um, so that's my new favorite at the moment. And that's simply, I think because of the, 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 the layout, just it just makes it so much easier to use than, than previous ones. So that's my current love, but I'm quite fickle on that front and ask me in a month's time and I might have a new love. <laughs> <laughs> favorite remedy or remedies if it's remedies you've got three <laughs> well so this is quite interesting for me so when I first graduated and then I started reading every other book under the sun because that's it, it because homeopathy becomes a hobby doesn't it as well as it mm. I thought oh wow there's all these remedies out there we've got all the traditional ones we've got all these new spangly ones I like those too so I've, I've, I've sort of been out there done other remedies and but I've always come back to the polycrest. It sounds really boring, but I don't think anyone should ever underestimate those. And the more children I treat, <clears throat> the more I see those come into their their absolute own glory. So I've gone, I've kind of looked out there and gone, no, 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 let's go back. <laughs> and um, I'm I'm absolutely loving the polycrest because with each each prescription I make, I learn like we're talking about different aspects, each the, the polarities of each remedy with each prescription I make of the polycress I learn a whole new part of that remedy or you know it it sort of enforces it so I love the polycress you just 
it's, it's encouraging me to sort of to use those more I think and I always when I graduated I heard about a homeopath I can't remember who it was he said it was a bit of an 80 20 rule you know 80 percent of the time he was using 20 percent of the remedies just walking around with a poly- polycress in his case I was like how can you do that and at the moment that's where I am and that's what I'm loving fascinating thank you so much for sharing that Rosie it's like mastermind this isn't it um, <laughs> favorite uh, favorite book if there is one I think the one I keep going back to is The Impossible Cure. I mean, Lance Guy, I just think it's just such a a really wonderful balance of an introduction that anyone can read to homeopathy, but with the combined knowledge of her experience, both being as a witness to homeopathy and then as a patient and then as a practitioner. I just think it, it, it explores the perfect balance of it's for anyone is able to read it, but it's got a really personal spin on it. And I, I, I really like how she writes in that book. I also love Healing Complex Shul- um, complex Children with Homeopathy. I can't remember, I think that's Lemke. Yes. Um, that's a, yeah, that's a brilliant book. And it, it's got so much knowledge in there. But I think the one that is most applicable to anyone from newly starting out, has never used a remedy before, um, to practitioner is um, The Impossible Cure. It's my favourite. Favourite remedy or remedies? I know it's a tough one. I always find my way back to Nat Muir. Absolutely love Nat Muir. I've seen it's done wonders for me throughout my life and I've seen it do wonders for others. The relief that it can bring of that just like heavy burdeny grief feeling. Um, I just, I think it's absolutely wonderful. I wish I could just like microdose it around the world because so many people I think need it and just yeah. takes one drop in the sea you're right I, I wish I see so much <laughs> I've, got, I've, I've got a good chunk of course to come with me and I, if I watch the news and I'm kind of feeling overburdened by so many difficult things that are going on around the world that sometimes I really wish that I could take a good a, a bottle of grief remedies and just let them do their magic Ready for the questions. Uh, Favourite book, if there is one. If there is one. These are really hard. It's like asking, what's your favourite? What's your favourite song? My go to book. um, I would see a lot of kids and babies in my clinic. So the clinical observations of children would be a big one. My work master. Isn't that right? Mm. Um, It's fantastic. Favourite remedy or remedies? Okay, I am going to give you three, like Rosie said there, Nat Muir. Nat Muir is one I could really run my clinic on. It's incredible, especially here in the backdrop of, of Northern Ireland. It's a very beautiful, beautiful remedy to have on hand. Carcinosin is another one that, you know, it's an Irish mommy remedy, and I think every Irish mommy should should take it. Um, and finally, we mentioned it earlier, but pulsatilla. And it's one I had, um, I suppose, huge prejudice about and biases until I was given it three over three years ago. And uh, yet it brought about my son. So I have a lot to be grateful for Pulsatilla for. And he now is a Pulsatilla. So lots of Pulsatilla energy in this house. It's It's been uh, fascinating, insightful and delightful talking to, to you today. And uh, I hope you know, you're the greatest success. I wish you the greatest success with your practice. And you must come back later this year. And uh, we'll talk some more on on your experiences. But for now, thank you so much, uh, Ailsa, Rosie and Melissa. And uh, it's just been great. I, I'm, I'm sure this will be one of the most popular episodes of the Homeopathy Health Show. Thank you. Oh, thank you so oh. much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been lovely. I really enjoyed it and meeting you all. Yeah, yeah, me too. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been brilliant. I do hope you've enjoyed the Homeopathy Health Show here on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. Tune in next time for more things homeopathy, interviews and segments on the healing possibilities that homeopathy can bring you. And don't forget to visit UK Health Radio online at www ukhealthradio.com to see the many other amazing shows available to listen live and on demand or why not download the app from the ios and android stores until next time stay safe and take care